Welcome back to Meet Me in the Middle. Thank you so much for joining me. I wanted to start this episode by reminding you that the website is up and contains a lot of information about our topics and titles for future episodes. So please visit the website. You can connect with me if you'd like to. I have a contact form there where you can write to me directly. And please don't forget to rate and share and comment wherever you get this podcast if you're enjoying it. I am now on YouTube at the request of a few people. Um, It's just a static image for now as the video but all podcasts are available on YouTube as well. And you can find all the links to wherever I am, where the podcast is broadcasting. You can find links on the website. I kind of want to start by explaining why I'm laying all this information out there, as it may seem like a lot of information or too much information or some information that you already know. However, I feel like understanding how our government was set up and how it works is an important foundation to helping us all understand how we can better participate, as well as understanding how these leaders impact like key aspects of our lives. These leaders who we elect have a lot more power than we all realize, so it's important to understand the power that they actually have. So we are a representative democracy, which means those representatives have the power of our voices as they walk into those seats. So we need to make our votes count. No, uh, no pun intended there. It's not enough just to vote. It's important that we vote wisely. Now that we understand where we've come from and how this government was set up in the Constitution, they laid out the formation of our federal government at the top level. It's really important to note that this is all mirrored at the state level. So in this episode, we're going to go down the layers of government to understand who runs what and who has oversight of what. And this episode is called Our Government at Work. You can now follow along on the website in the episode resources section where you will find all the valuable links to each topic, including all the state links. So let's get started. It's important to note that there are many laws and acts that are in place at the federal and state levels, which you can search for on your state website. Please be careful and make sure you are on your actual state site. Their their links, their actual links are on my website under the government structure section. At the federal level, all laws and acts can be found in several places. So you've got the archives, the Library of Congress, or the Senate and the House sites. Again, make sure you are on a government site to ensure that you're getting the language of the law. All the links can be found on my website. I've taken great care to ensure that all the information that we talk about is in these sections under the episode resource sections and I've tried to make it easy. All clickable links, it's mobile friendly, and so on. So when we look at the Constitution and the fact that we've laid out three branches of government, which are the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, and copied in every single state, and the legislative being broken out into two chambers, which means the House and the Senate, except for Nebraska, which is a unisimerial uh, system where they only have one uh, house or chamber. I want to point out also that the link on the website has 
a section at the very top under this section called Our Government at Work, where there's a government manual. And it's a great resource. It's got all the government agency acronyms and abbreviations, um, all kinds of stuff in there, which is really cool. And you should check it out. All right. So let's start with the executive branch. Did you know that 4 million employees work for the executive branch? Wow, that's a lot of employees. I actually didn't know that. The president leads the executive branch and is sworn in at the inauguration in January, on January 20th, which is the last inauguration. He swears an oath to the Constitution in public, in front of every American. The requirement to run for office are very few. You must be 35 years old, at least. You must be a natural born citizen of the United States and must have lived in the United States for at least 14 years. The president is both the head of state, the head of the government of the United States, and the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. The President represents all citizens with the best intent of the people. The President also enforces all laws passed by the Congress. They represent our nation when in talks with foreign countries. The president has the ability to veto and sign bills sent by Congress. The president has 10 days to sign or pass a bill or veto it. If nothing is done, the bill is automatically enacted. I have not found a case where this has actually happened. The president also has the power to grant pardons. They nominate Supreme Court and federal department heads. These must be confirmed by the Senate. So we're going to talk about that. So this, basically when the president nominates any department head or anyone uh, to a key position, there are some positions nominated, some positions appointed. If it's nominated, it must always be confirmed by the Senate. The Senate holds the sole power of confirmations. They appoint ambassadors. Uh, the, the president appoint, appoints ambassadors and the president writes executive orders. Executive orders are directives that involve government agencies only. The president does not have the power to enact any law that affects the citizens unless they're calling for um, martial law for whatever reason, which does affect all citizens, of course. This is at their sole discretion as the head of the executive branch to write executive orders. These really do affect mainly government agencies and how they are working or stopping something from happening or pushing something through like stopping pipelines or pushing forward pipelines as a prime example. The president has the power to send our military without calling for an act of war. Only Congress can call for an act of war. And as long as Congress is notified within 48 hours and the soldiers do not remain longer than 60 days, the president can act alone. However, the term act alone sounds a little bit strange. It's not really act alone because they have a lot of people to answer to. So I haven't also found an instance in history where the president acted alone. The president is limited to no more than two four-year terms by election. The vice president reports to the president as part of the cabinet. The cabinet reports directly to the president. They're the heads of the federal branches of government. 
the requirement for the vice president, um, they are sworn in by the Senate and they take an oath to uphold the Constitution. And again, you can find the different oaths that they take on the website. The oaths that the Senate and the Congress and the judges and the vice president take are the same. The president has a different oath. The requirement for a VP to run for office is you must be 35 years of age, be a natural born citizen, and must have lived in the United States for at least 14 years. The two main functions for the vice president are first and foremost to take over as president, if necessary, upon death, incapacitation, or impeachment of the president. Also, the vice president presides over the Senate only on ceremonial occasions, such as counting of the electoral votes in Congress preceding a general election, and when a tie-breaking vote is needed in the Senate. The cabinet is made up of 25 people, and we're going to go into that now. So the cabinet has the vice president, and the cabinet has the chief of staff. So the vice president is obviously elected, and they can only serve, they can, they they have unlimited terms under the vice president of four year terms, but as long as they're elected, they can serve unlimited amount of times as VP. So many people pick them as the vice president. This has only happened twice in history. The chief of staff is appointed only, does not need any kind of confirmation. The rest of the cabinet are nominated, the cabinet leaders, and the department heads are nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And you'll be able to see all of these different divisions of the cabinet as well. So the cabinet members are the secretary of state, secretary of treasury, secretary of defense, the attorney general, which runs the department of justice, secretary of the interior, secretary of agriculture, secretary of commerce, secretary of labor, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary of House and Urban Development, Secretary of Transportation, Secretary of Energy, Secretary of Education, Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Secretary of Homeland Security, the Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Director of National Intelligence, the United States Trade Representative, U.S. Ambassador to the United, Union, uh, the United Nations, Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Administrator of the Small Business Administration, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, and the Director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Again, the Chief of Staff is appointed and is responsible for the Executive Office of Government. The president also uh, sits on the committee, which is the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This is a nominated position, the director, and can only serve one four-year term. And carries on into the next presidency if they were nominated late in a previous presidency. So the Joint Chiefs of Staff are, and again, this is on the website, um, are all of the heads of all these different military divisions. So, the agencies are basically, in the cabinet, there's 15 executive department heads, one VP, one chief of staff, and eight executive agency heads. There are many organizations and agencies under these over overreaching offices and departments and can be found on my website. When you click on each one of those offices, you will then be able to see the departments um, and the councils on each website. So look at the different departments and who leads them on their, on their site. 
which can be found on my website. The president also leads the executive office of the government. This is led by the chief of staff. So the chief of staff has a lot of different divisions that report into the chief of staff. These are a mix of nominated and confirmed and appointed. So I'm just going to go through the list. Council of Economic Advisors, Council of Environmental Quality, Domestic Policy Council, Gender Policy Council, National Economic Council, National Security Council, Climate Policy Office, the Office of the Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator, the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, the Office of Management and Budget, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, Office of Public Engagement, Office of Science and Technology Policy, Office of National Sub- Su- Cybersecurity, Office of U.S. Trade Representative, Presidential Personal Personnel Office, the National Space Council, and the White House Office. So when you click like on the White House Office, this is where you would find, um, you know, the press secretary and so on. So all of those different offices are run by the chief of staff. There are also many other divisions, the executive department, which and sub departments and agencies and independent agencies and bureaus and boards and commissions. There are many and you can see lists of them on the website. You'll be able to find all the links of the divisions and subdivisions. This is all managed by the executive branch. So when you kind of take that in, it's like, whoa, that is a lot of divisions. And when you go to the government manual, it's quite interesting. You can see all the acronyms. I you know in my first podcast, I'm like the CIA, the DOD, the FBI. Oh my gosh, there are. <laughs> and whatever ones I missed, I missed a lot. So um, please go in, check out the government manual. Even if you just go to the agency's page and look at all the acronyms, it's pretty interesting. So that takes us to now the legislative branch. The Congress resides at the Capitol building and is split into two bodies or chambers. And that's the Senate and the House. They also swear an oath to uphold the Constitution upon taking office after being elected. The legislative branch employs over 10,000 people. They both chambers enact laws and committees of oversight of laws and departments of the government and are the only body that can declare war jointly. If a declaration of war is approved, the president as commander in chief will lead the effort and keep Congress up to date on all matters. They both can vote a vetoed bill. And we're going to talk about bills in a minute. But if the president vetoes a bill that got passed by both chambers, because you can't put a bill in front of the president unless both chambers agree to the bill and approve it to be sent. However... If a president vetoes a bill, it can go back to the Congress. And as long as both chambers obtain two-thirds of the votes in both chambers to overturn a vetoed bill. So where do the ideas of bills come from? They come from everywhere. They come from the president, senators, house members, lobbyists, states, Citizens of any state, they can appeal to their representatives in Congress to put a bill forward. All bills are sent to the Federal Register after they've been signed into law. Many old bills can be found on the National Archives and Library of Congress websites. Again, you'll find those links on my website under this section. Lobbyists will be a future podcast in the campaign finance section of the election series. That will be a series. When a bill is proposed in either chamber, they do have the ability to consult legislative counsel in Congress for the bill to be put into legal language. No bill shall ever contradict the Constitution. 
The Constitution requires that the bills coming from the House and the Senate have the exact same wording, which is rare because they usually will completely change the language of these different bills. And so they bring the bills in alignment through a conference committee, which is convened, consisting of members from both chambers. The two chambers operate under very different rules as well as how they conduct their proceedings. There are nine departments or offices that are managed jointly by the House and the Senate. These different offices are as such the architect of the Capitol. The director is nominated and confirmed and is a 10-year term. The Congressional Budget Office, the director is nominated and confirmed, and it's a four-year term. The U.S. Government of Accountability Office is nominated and confirmed and is a 15-year term. The Government Publishing Office, the director, is there's advice and consent to the nomination, but it's, a, it's not confirmed. It's a 10-year term. The Library of Congress is... Uh, a director is by advice and consent a 10 year term. The Office of Congressional Workplace Rights is appointed a four year term. The Congressional Research Service is appointed, there's no term. So they can s- serve at the pleasure of, of, the, uh, of the Congress. Capitol Police. The director is appointed, again, no term. And then the Congressional Office for International Leadership is appointed and no term. These offices or divisions are jointly managed by the House and the Senate. The House of Representatives has 435 members. And Remember, they're based on congressional districts, which we spoke about in the Government Structure podcast in Episode 6. The requirements to run for a House seat is you must be at least 25 years of age and a citizen for at least seven years and must inhabit the state they are representing. The the unique powers of the House are impeachment of federal employees and elected officials. They are the only chamber that can draft revenue bills. They still have to pass the Senate, but they can only be drafted by the House. They also confirm the vice president's appointments and approve all trade treaties coming from the Senate. The House is responsible for drafting legislation. Bills can be dropped in the box on the House floor and it is sent to the appropriate committee. If there are more committees involved in that bill, then the primary committee will take it up. All bills must pass both chambers and signed by the president to become law. The House also has a responsibility of oversight of all laws and standing committees have oversight of federal departments, agencies, and councils. And you can see uh, on my website a list of those committees. At the start of the Congress, the majority party elects a speaker by a full House vote. They vote on a set of House rules that will remain in place for two years. The speaker is in charge of the calendar and decides what bills are put forward to the floor. So even though all bills are assigned to a committee, doesn't mean they'll all make it to the floor. That is the sole discretion of the Speaker of the House. Remember, they represent districts, so there's 435 members, so their debate time is truly limited. As you can imagine, five minutes for each member is a lot. They're assigned and they sit on committees, and you can see a list of those committees again on the website. Standing committees are established at the time that the rules of the House are adopted or by amending the House rules. The jurisdiction of each standing committee is really specified in the House rules. Under the rules, the chairman and the members of standing committees are selected through a two-step process. So basically, all the Democrats get together and all the Republicans get together, and those are called caucuses or conferences. 
They recommend the members to serve on the committees. The majority party recommends a chairman for each committee. The minority party recommends a ranking member, as well as the whips. Whips are there to mobilize votes for passing legislation. So they're the ones who go around and try to figure out who will pass this bill and who wouldn't. Who's interested? Who can they lobby themselves? So the whips are also but under the ranking member and the um, majority party leader. <clears throat> Finally, the full house has to approve the recommendations of the party caucuses. And it's important to note that the rules of the Democratic, the Democrat caucus and the Republican conference determines the nomination procedure for their members. Rules of the party nominations may therefore differ, but the approval by the house is conducted according to the House rules. The 118th Congress has 26 committees in the House, and under each committee, there are subcommittees. So on the website, you can click on a committee and you can see all the subcommittees. Um, so you go to the Judiciary Committee and you can see all the different subcommittees that they are actually forming, and they just dispense the people from the committee into those subcommittees. These committees can conduct investigations, hold hearings, have subpoena power. They can call industry leaders, company leaders, government department heads and staff, as well as private citizens. They can recommend legal action, but cannot take legal action. That will fall to the attorney general to decide. They have an obligation to keep the public, the press, and key government officials informed about the work that they're doing in the People's House. And you can watch a lot of these committees live and subcommittees at work. All House members serve two-year terms. The entire House is up for election every two years. There are no limits as to how long that they can serve as long as they are elected. The Senate. There's a hundred people in the Senate two per state, as we spoke about in the last episode. The requirements to become a senator are that you're 30 years of age and a citizen and, um, for at least nine years and a resident of the state they are representing at the time of the election. The Senate is responsible for all confirmation hearings of all presidential appointments and approve all treaties except those involving trade as that's a revenue generating um, rem revenue generating, which is all done at the House. So the House holds the purse strings. The Senate is responsible for drafting legislation bills and they are brought by committees, not just dropped in a box like at the House and are placed on the calendar. All of the bills are assigned a title and a number. The titles go like this, either H or HJR, which means the bill originated in the House or a House joint resolution. Or the title is S or SJR, which the bill originated in the Senate or the Senate joint resolution. <clears throat> All bills must pass both chambers and signed by the president to become law. Or if the president received it and didn't do anything for 10 days, then it automatically becomes law. The Senate also has the responsibility of oversight of all laws and under, um, understanding committees has oversight of federal departments, agencies, and councils. These different committees have are overseeing different divisions. So the House has different ones than the Senate. So they don't both oversee or, ha or, or direct oversight necessarily to the same divisions of the government. So this ensures like a separation of powers. Remember, they represent the whole state and there are only 100 members of the Senate. So their debate time is really unlimited. There are 24 committees in the Senate. 
Each party nominates a leader called the majority and minority leaders along with the whips, same way as the House. However, the whips in the Senate do sometimes um, serve as acting floor, f- floor leaders. And every two years, the committee heads are up for change or vote because of the change of certain number of people up for vote in the general election. Senators are formally elected to standing committees by the entire Senate. But in practice, each party conference is largely responsible for determining which of the members will sit on each committee. So there are party conferences, so committee on committees or a steering committee to make committee appointments. Considering such qualifications as seniority, areas of expertise, relevance of committee jurisdiction on the senator's state, in both conferences, the floor leader has authority to make some committee assignments, which can provide the leader with a method of promoting party discipline through the granting or withholding of desired assignments. The number of seats a party holds in the Senate determines its share of seats in each committee. So you can see how it's different. Also, the Senate divides committees into categories based on their importance. So Class A, Class B, and Class C. Each senator may serve on no more than two Class A committees and one Class B committee, unless granted special permission. There are no limits to service on Class C committees. A third of the House is up for re-election every two years. One term is six years. There are no limits as to how many times they can serve as long as they're elected. So if a member of the House dies, the governor will call for a special election to be held in that corresponding state. If a senator dies, the governor of that state appoints a new senator and then it's confirmed by the state's Senate and they serve out the rest of their term. It's really important to know your representatives, what committees they're sitting on, what they're actually working on. All of this is has you can find on the websites that I have on my um, that I've posted all the links to really understand the values of what they're voting for, of how they conduct themselves. Watch them in committees. Watch them on the House floor. Are they actually upholding your values or just the values of the party? Because this can change over time. So that's really important. All right. The last and final piece of this podcast is really going through the judicial branch of government. All federal judges take an oath to uphold the Constitution There are 30,000 people that work in the federal judicial branch. All federal judges are appointed, nominated by the, or sorry, they're all nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. All federal judge appointments. Article 3 of the Constitution of the United States guarantees that every person accused of wrongdoing has the right to a fair trial before a competent judge and a jury of one's peers. All federal judge appointments are for life. The U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. All laws, all bills, all courts all judgments, all everything has to be leveled to and ratified to the Constitution. The Constitution um, laid out that to create a federal system of government in which the power is shared between the federal government and the state governments. So due to federalism, So both the federal government and each of the state governments have their own court systems. It's really about the balance of power and to ensure that local understanding and representation is had by the different state jurisdictions of the courts. 
Federal courts are really there to hear cases involving the constitutionality of a law. Cases involving the laws and treaties of the U.S. ambassadors and public ministers, disputes between two or more states, maritime law, and bankruptcy cases are all handled by the federal judicial branch. Bankruptcies can only be heard in a federal bankruptcy court, not a state court, even though it's a bankruptcy court in your state. And that's really important to understand. And again, that state, those structures and all the links are on the website. There are many courts that fall under the federal judiciary branch. There are links to all of those courts on this section of the, our, our government at work section. The Supreme Court's the highest court in the land. There is no appealing a Supreme Court decision. All the decisions are final. There are the Court of Appeals, which are 13 districts. And how that's broken up is there's a map. So each court is a circuit court. So circuit one, two, three, four, five, all the way through 11. And they handle a district of states, a group of states. And you'll see that map on the website. Then there's a federal circuit court that deals with the district court of appeals because there's district courts and then of the federal government. And then there's, of course, your local state courts. So international trade courts, tax court, veteran claims of appeals um, court, and then the federal claims court. So these are all handled under the court of appeals. And then you have an Article I courts, which basically hears U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, the U.S. Court of Appeals for Armed Forces, and the U.S. Tax Court. And then you have 94 U.S. District level trial courts that are federal courts, but they're called district courts, and there's 94 of them. And again, you can go and find what courts of, of the federal court levels sit inside your state. There are 94. The U.S. bankruptcy courts, there's 91 bankruptcy courts. And then there, is, there are five of the 13 courts of appeals that hear uh, appeals for bankruptcy. So if they don't agree with the court, bankruptcy court, it can go to one of the five of the 13 appeal courts, which are the 5th, 6th, 8th, ninth, and 10th Circuit. And again, you can see all of that on the website. There is also a system called PACER. It's a public access to court electronic records that have all cases filed in the federal court system. And each state court has a similar system for all court cases. All court cases are a public record. There's also a site that you can look at how the courts are doing. It's really cool. It's a report. It's the court's report. There are some very interesting data there, like wiretap reports for each state and caseload reports. It's very interesting. Understanding that court structure is important as to where you go when you have a problem. And of course, the highest court in the land, then the federal courts, then the state courts, and then the states have Supreme Courts, so, and they have appeal courts, so at the state level. And then if they get the, all through the different court systems, so if you have a case in a normal trial court in your state, and you're not happy, you go to an appeals court in the state and then it goes to the supreme court of the state and if a supreme court if it's actually then a dispute further and a further appeal appeal is is moving forward then the supreme courts would actually then go to one of the 13 appeals courts depending on the district where that state resides so it's very interesting, and there is an oversight report on the court system. It's, it's fascinating to read, um, and it, again, it's on the website. 
There are approximately 6,400 jails holding over 2 million people in the United States. So the criminal justice system, jails, will be a future topic for a different podcast. So looking at all of how this is all set up, it really is full transparency. There's tons of checks and balances on committees, but it really still stems from who we vote for that we're trusting to represent us in a representative democracy. The state governments all together have a total of 14.8 million employees across the board as of 2021. So that brings the total government workforce to a total of 19 million people that work for the government in some capacity, either at a federal or state level. 19 million people, by far the largest employer in America is the government's. I've provided state links in the government structure section where you can look at your state sites so you can read your constitutions, look at the governor's office, which is the executive branch of the state, the legislative branch, which is in your state, and all applicable laws, state agencies, such as the DMV and so on. I have included a link for every court system site for each state in this section, as they're quite often separate sites for the judiciary branches in each state. The more we know, the more we grow. By understanding our structures and processes, we can get a sense of how this system was built to protect us and our states by design. The more we understand the way our government works and the responsibilities we hand our elected leaders in this representative democracy, the better choices that we for sure will make. The next episode, we will cover the political parties and future episodes will be the history of religion and elections and many more topics like lobbying, the prison system, and voting laws across the states. Again, thank you so much for listening and please go to the website for all the links to dig deeper. Until next time, remember, from the middle, we can educate ourselves on why things work the way they do and how we can influence change together by talking about how we want our government to work for us, for the people, by the people. Thank you so much. Until next time.